Good evening, everyone. That's Sarah's too. My name is Jessica Byron. And I am the director of the UWI Institute of International Relations. It's my pleasure to welcome all of you to this joint IIR CPC webinar that launches our academic year. So in addition to greeting all our distinguished guests and members of the UWI community this evening, I extend a special welcome to the students and the alumni of the Institute of International Relations. This is the second collaborative event that the Institute is hosting with the Caribbean Policy Consortium. Some of you may have attended our first joint event back in June. The Caribbean Policy Consortium is made up of Caribbean and North American academics, public and private sector professionals, and advocates whose work focuses on Caribbean development and security concerns and on Caribbean United States relations. The CPC partners with various universities, including the UWI, and both the Shridat Ramphal Center at UWI Cave Hill and the Institute of International Relations at the St. Augustine campus are focal points for this collaboration. So our topic this evening is the United States and the Caribbean new opportunities for strategic engagement. We have an impressive array of six leading experts in their respective subject areas, and I am delighted that they can join us today. They are Professor Ive Law Griffith, Brigadier, retired Brigadier General Boris Saavedra, Professor Carlos Alsugaray, Dr. George Poriol, Professor Anthony Bryan, and Professor Norman Munro. Each panelist will speak for about 12 minutes. And after the presentations have concluded, there will be a Q&A session for about 30 minutes. So now I will proceed to introduce our first speaker, who is Professor Ivlaw Griffith. Professor Griffith is a fellow with the Washington DC based Caribbean Policy Consortium. He's a long standing expert on Caribbean security, drugs, and crime, and he has published numerous scholarly articles and books. He has testified before the US Congress on Caribbean security issues and served as consultant to many international agencies. And he has also served in several academic leadership roles, including being the vice chancellor of the University of Guyana and dean at Florida International University. Um, with that, I would like to welcome you again, Professor Griffith. And um, you will be speaking on a new paradigm for US Caribbean engagement. Over to you. Thank you. Let me begin by thanking Professor Byron for that generous introduction, not only of me, but of the partnership between IIR and CPC. And allow me as well to thank Professor Byron, who is also part of the CPC, member of the steering committee, for not only enabling us to have this joint program facilitated, but to thank members of our staff, particularly Zara, uh, for enabling us to have this done very efficiently. Next slide, please. There's a very distinguished British statesman called Anthony Eden. Anthony Eden was for a long time secretary, foreign secretary of the United Kingdom of Britain, Northern Ireland. But he was also a long-standing deputy to Winston Churchill. And when Winston Churchill was ousted in 1955, he succeeded Winston Churchill. I've admired some of the writings of Anthony Eden. And there is something that he said back in the 50s that struck me as a good point of departure for the conversation about United States 
and the Caribbean in the contemporary context. And this is what Anthony Eden said. He said, there is nothing more dangerous than a foreign policy based on unreality. There is nothing more dangerous than a foreign policy based on unreality. Anthony Eden was making a plea at any moment of crafting new policy, any moment of introducing a revision of policy to do a reality check. And I thought in the context of the change of administration in the United States, it's an opportune time as we think of United States Caribbean relations for us to do a reality check. And so I will share with you in my remaining eight or 8.5 minutes or so, uh, my perspective of the reality check that one can do. Next slide, please. Looking at the United States and the Caribbean. But I think it's important to do this reality check at this propitious moment, especially because of the unorthodoxy of the Trump team, the Trump presidency. That unorthodoxy, not only in relation to the United States Caribbean relations, but United States global relations. That unorthodoxy prompted lots of individuals and organizations to have high expectations of the Biden administration and its pursuits. So I thought it's important to keep in mind not only the change, but the character of what was there that precipitated the change, uh, the movement from the unorthodoxy of Trump to what people have high expectations of, of orthodoxy moving forward uh, in the administration of Joseph Biden. Next slide, please. But I think as we think of a reality check at a time of a change in leadership, it's useful to keep in mind something that a friend of many of ours, long-standing but now late expert in Latin America and the Caribbean, Robert Bob Pastor. Bob Pastor said something in a 1994 article in the Annals of American Academy of political and social sciences that I think it's worthy to remember. He said that United States interests do not change radically from one administration to the next, but the value and priority that each administration attaches to these interests often changes quite markedly. What Bapasta was saying is that we should temper our expectations of radical change from administration as we do this reality check I think it's a useful to keep, next slide please, Bob Pastor's admonition in mind. So I wanna spend the next few minutes kind of probing a key question. That key question is, what are some plausible reality check observations about the United States interests and policy pursuits in relation to the region that we might make? What can we say, keeping in mind Anthony Eden's proposition, Keeping in mind Bob Pastor's proposition, what might we say as regards some things about United States Caribbean relations? What I'd like to do is to frame the next few minutes, those observations into two categories. Share a couple of what I call context observations, broad framing kinds of observations. And then in the remaining time, if we have much time, if any time, I'll share a few content observations. First context and then content. Let's go to the next slide, please. Here is the first observation that we might make. And I think it's important to observe that these observations are not made in any rank order of importance. They're just listed. One is not necessarily more important than two. I think it's important to make an observation that Team Biden, the Biden administration does not by itself determine the nature and the trajectory of engagement with the Caribbean or with any region. There's some other contextual, there's some other historical antecedents that are there to part, partly to frame. And we'll talk a little bit more about what some of those important framing issues elements are. 
But going beyond that first observation, I think it, it's worthy to make a second observation. And that, that second observation is that the nature and trajectory of those pursuits are influenced by American national interests, are, in, are influenced by values, but also are influenced by developments within the Caribbean. What Biden does will likely be a function of American strategic interests, American values, and response to things happening within the Caribbean. Now, I think it's also useful to remind ourselves, and this is my third observation, that there are a couple of critical strategic interests and values that the United States for decades, again, remembering Bob Pastor, have, uh, has had guiding what it, it does around the world, not necessarily with consistency. And if we look at the Caribbean, or if we look at the hemisphere in which the Caribbean lies, we find that one of those values is democracy. One of those interests has to do with geopolitics, the relationship between geography and power, things involving strategic materials, strategic waterways. One of those values, one of those interests also has to do with geoeconomics, the relationship between materials and the pursuit of opportunities for economic growth and development on the part of American business. And geonarcotics for me is a critical third, what I call the, the three Gs, the transnational organized crime that is particularly a function of what the movement of illegal uh, drugs is all about. But one can make the fourth observation as follows, that the relationship within the hemisphere between the United States and the Caribbean is not purely a state to state relationship. There are gonna be many other, have been many other actors, non-state actors, businesses, relations with international governmental organizations. So in looking at the relations, one can expect a continuity in the sense that it's not only the United States as a state dealing with, let's say, a Cuba or a Jamaica or a Guyana. There are a number of other actors. Some of those actors are non-state actors. Let's go to the next slide, please. It's worthy of to note that what is true of United States Caribbean relations of, let's say, four decades ago will likely be true of Caribbean United States relations going forward with the Biden administration. And that is the engagement will be characterized by multidimensionality. What do I mean by that? Well, some of the relations will be on a multilateral basis. United States dealing with CARICOM, United States dealing with the OAS in relation to the Caribbean. But some of it will be in bilateral basis, bilateralism, Bilateral engagement has not been a substitute for a multilateral engagement. The two will coexist. It is also realistic to expect that cooperation will also coexist with competition. And we'll, we'll see some of that with other panel members who in exploring both individual state issues and complex cross-cutting issues, both cooperation and competition will be there. Now, it is also true that, and particularly in relation to geo geopolitics, that while the United States is dealing with the Caribbean, it is dealing with other actors, other state actors, other non-state actors, some of whom are not in the Caribbean. The United States will have to deal with strategic interests on the part of China in the Caribbean. United States will have to deal with Russia's interests in the Caribbean, whether you focus on the Caribbean on an insular basis or a basin basis. We know Iran also has had some interests, particularly in uranium in the Caribbean. So I think it's important in looking at United States Caribbean to keep in mind that there are other actors, extra hemispheric actors, extra regional actors that will come into the, the matrix of engagement uh, in relation to these two sets of actors. But let me say finally, before I turn to the sixth observation, that in looking at United States Caribbean engagement, 
we've got to look not only at what United States interests are, it's important to keep in mind that the interests of Caribbean countries and collectivities of Caribbean countries, one of which is the, is the CARICOM, one of which is the regional security system, one of which is the OECS. We've got to keep in mind that there are interests of Caribbean nation and entities of Caribbean interests that have also have to be that also have to be kept uh, in mind in looking at this set of uh, Biden and beyond engagement. Let's go to the final slide. Let's go to the next slide, the final observation insofar as context. And I thought I'd just share with you three or four sentences also from Bob Pastor. I don't know if we can adjust the slides to have the whole slide put up. There are a couple of lines that are missing, uh, but I can, I can also read you what those lines are uh, fully from my printed version. And Bob Pastor wrote several books where he talked about United States Latin American relations being like in a whirlpool context. And that article, that 1994 article that focused particularly on the Caribbean, he said the following, and I think it's worthy of sharing the three or four sentences in their entirety. Here's what Bob Pastor said in that article. One pattern that stands out is the way in which United States attention to the region fluctuates between obsession and disinterest. I have referred to this pattern as a whirlpool, a whirling ED which occasionally sucks the United States into a vortex of crisis, where it becomes preoccupied by small Caribbean nations or their leaders. United States presidents react to the crises with security, political and economic programs that have historical antecedents, even if the policymakers at the time are not aware of them. Then almost as suddenly, United States interests and resources shift away from the region. And many Americans can hardly recall either their nemesis or the reason for their intervention. I think it's worthy of mentioning as we end the conversation about context to keep in mind the notion of the whirlpool. United States engagement in the Caribbean characterized as a whirlpool of vortex. Let's go to the, to the next slide. We're coming to the end. I know Professor Barron is getting nervous that this Griffith guy is speaking a little, a little long. But I think given the brevity of time we've got, and I'm gonna spend more opportunity in the written version of this that I write up in a few weeks, elaborating on a couple of content observations. I'm sure many of us recall George Orwell's animal farm. All, our, all animals are equal, but some are more equal than others. But I think the same can be said about foreign policy engagement. All policy issues or all security issues may be important, but some are gonna be relatively more important than others. And I think in looking at the engagement, we've gotta keep in mind that there's some issues that are likely to be for the United States and for the Caribbean, relatively more important than others. Let me share with you what I think, and I'll elaborate on these in the written version of this, that are likely to dominate the attention of the United States as it engages with the Caribbean in the Biden time. We, we all had a healthy reminder this year, even if we want to pretend to forget previous years, we had a healthy reminder of the danger, trauma of the climate. La Soufriere was a powerful reminder the tropical storms and the hurricanes so far are powerful reminders. And I, I see uh, in, in that sense, I think it's important to recognize that one issue that is likely to command for much of the Biden administration time is the matter of climate resilience. The matter of energy security also is likely to be one of those more equal than other issues commanding the attention of the Biden administration 
in relation to its Caribbean engagement. The issue of health, not only health qua health, but health geopolitics given the COVID pandemic. Uh, one of the partnership programs with the CPC, with the Florida International, focus on the issue of geopolitics, COVID issues, and there's a forthcoming uh, occasional paper that I authored that goes in depth on this issue. This will be an issue because of the multiplicity of connectivities that it has, health geopolitics, COVID and its aftermath that will command a lot of attention. An issue of increasing importance that will likely command significant attention going forward is the issue of cybersecurity. I will tease this issue out in the written version. Matter of fact, I have a chapter on cybersecurity in the forthcoming book. This matter of cybersecurity for very much in the last few years has, been, has not been commanding the attention it requires, but the circumstances are forcing both Caribbean operators, private and public sector, as well as uh, United States operatives largely because of security issues on the United States part. So this is like, in my view, to be one of those critical content relation issue areas. The Caribbean Basin Security Initiative also is still there. I've got a proposal uh, that I'm gonna be authoring about how it might not only be renewed, one of the harsh realities of the, the Trump administration has been underfunding of CBSI this, I think, is an opportunity for that issue to regain the kind of prominence it deserves. But let me end on what I know will be issues raised by other members of this panel. There are a number of what I call Cold War holdover issues that I think will have be already begun to be addressed. And I'm talking primarily of the Cuba-United States relations. That's a holdover, Cold War holdover issue in my view but also United States Venezuela in the context of a holdover uh, from, the, from the Cold War era. I think, and we saw this week in Mexico, some of the dynamics of the Venezuela United States, uh, there is no reason for us not to expect United States Venezuela, United States Cuba, not to be part of clear and present dangers critical issue areas going forward. Let me go finally to some final thoughts with the next slide. And I will offer just two sets of final thoughts, one of which draws upon uh, my friend or friend Bob Pastor. I mentioned earlier that important in thinking about United States Caribbean relations, not only to consider what are United States interests and United States values, but what also is important for the Caribbean. This is an opportunity, this is a necessary occasion for Caribbean leaders to be proactive in relation to their own Caribbean interests. Very often we've, we have a legitimate criticism that sometimes Caribbean leaders do not define, do not articulate, do not represent their interests collectively. I think this is an opportunity, I would say, for engaging the Biden administration, but go with an agenda to the Biden administration, rather than being only an agent receiving what values and pursuits coming from the United States. So let me end on Bob Pastor, with another quote from that very useful article. He says, the United States is therefore both a solution and a problem, a source of aid and arrival, an outlet for unskilled labor and a magnet for the region's talent. Caribbean nations all confront a vexing strategic dilemma how to retain autonomy while seeking regional integration, how to elude the dominance of the United States while securing improved access, access to its market. 
But Pastor wrote this in 1994. I would contend finally that there still is validity to his proposition. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Griffith. And I think you've opened the way very nicely for me to introduce retired Brigadier General Boris Saavedra, our next speaker, who is going to be speaking to us on Venezuela challenges and opportunities. Dr. Boris Saavedra has, is a retired Venezuelan Air Force General Officer but he has devoted more than 30 years of his professional life to academic activities, both in Venezuela and in the United States. He's a graduate of the Venezuelan Air Force Academy and his um, doctorate comes from the National Distance Education University in Spain. And he has also studied at George Washington University in the United States. In his area of specialization, peace and international security, he has co-authored several books and articles. Uh, Dr. Saavedra, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Biden. Good evening. It is an honor and a privilege for me to be here. First, I would like to express my gratitude to Dr. Professor Jessica Byron, Dr. Ivelo Griffith, and the organizers of this important event for the kind invitation to participate. A Colombian businessman regard as the chief deal maker for Nicolas Maduro, Venezuelan government is almost certain to be extradite to the United States after losing his final legal battle on Tuesday, September 7, in Cape Verde. The Atlantic Island Country Constitutional Court ruled there was nothing untoward about the detention in June last year of Alex Sa, who was arrested in Cape Verde last year at Washington B. Hayes. He was indicted in the US for money laundering and is under sanction and Tuesday ruling clear the way for him to be sent to the United States. <clears throat> this is a major hit to dismantle the Maduro regime complex adaptive threat network abroad with major impact in the current negotiation in Mexico. On August 13, 2021, the Venezuelan government and the opposition met in Mexico City to sign a memorandum of understanding ahead of more detailed talks in September to reach an agreement on conditions and term for holding the vote later this year in November scheduled elections. This latest round of talk, the third in four years, are taking place on the very different circumstance. The only constant being that Maduro remain in power. The country crisis has worsened. The opposition has weakened and fractured. The United States policy toward Venezuela remain unclear. A million of people in the troubled country are more focused on surviving the pandemic than on politics. Based in the short time that we have, let me go to bottom line. First, negotiation in Venezuela are largely ineffective because of the vicious cycle of sham election where the Maduro regime used high level of disinformation, intelligence and counterintelligence 
an strategic influence operation to consistently deceive the international community about his intention to negotiate the political opposition. Second, while the Venezuelan opposition and many international observers are distracted by vicious cycle of sham election, the Maduro regime is ramping up the, his complex adaptive threat network throughout the region. Third, Venezuela threat network is what complicate any negotiation process with the Venezuela, but rather than weaken this Maduro regime, it hardens and expands his threat network, co-opting otherwise legitimate business and NGOs. Going all in with negotiation without knowing the nature of the, op the opponent and a proper diagnosis of both the Maduro regime strategic deception strategy and his threat network will lead to a zero zoom game where the regime has all the leverage and control. By dismantling Venezuela complex adaptive threat network abroad, you take away leverage an option from the Maduro regime, making a negotiation process more viable in the future. Venezuela has reached another crossroad. Interim President Juan Guaido recently presented a proposal for the Venezuelan people for renewed negotiation with the Maduro regime. Many Venezuelans, both in country and abroad, remain skeptical of further dialogue and negotiation with the Maduro regime. In the past, the regime has repeatedly used negotiation as a stalling tactic, further dividing the political opposition and distracting the international community. The question then is not whether a negotiation should take place. It should, but at what cost and under what condition? More importantly, how do negotiation play into the larger strategy of a strategic deception by the Maduro regime? And what is the analytical construct of such as a strategy that allowed the Maduro regime to dangle the empty prospect of free and fair elections in Venezuela? The analysis begins with the detailed understanding and how the Maduro regime perpetuate a vicious cycle of negotiation that lead to shame elections. From the point of view of hemispheric security and defense Venezuelan government officials are actively involved in international crime and using the state resources, including the military assets, to support illicit activity such as money laundering and drug smuggling. These officials also have collaborated with the external regional actors, such as Iran and Hezbollah, incorporating them into their criminal network. U.S. policymaker, the European Union, and most countries in the region should apply sanctions against key Venezuelan officials whose criminal activity helped sustain the authoritarian regime. Sanctioning officials at the highest level of leadership would further expose the regime's rampant criminality and undercut his operation 
of the Venezuelan people. I want to finish this very brief analysis by saying that today, the Maduro regime, with the support of Argentina, Bolivia, Mexico, Cuba, and Nicaragua, and no action from most countries in the region, and one week after the departure of the United States from Afghanistan, parenthesis, Center for Production and Distribution of Drug Worldwide, we are in the new vicious cycle, part of the strategy used by the Maduro regime in recent years to stay in power and continue developing organized crime and drug trafficking activity worldwide with the support of Russia, Iran, China, and the new Taliban government in Afghanistan as a major hub for international crime activities and potential drug dealing worldwide. I think with this, I will stop. I will be willing and open to discuss and go deep in one of the observations I made in my very short analysis of the current situation in Venezuela. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Saavedra. I'm certain that you will get some questions when the discussion comes up. Thank you for joining us. And I now go to our third speaker um, who will be speaking on Cuba, challenges and opportunities, Professor Carlos Alsugaray, um, who was a Cuban diplomat for over three decades. And he has also taught for many years at Cuba's Institut Instituto Superior de Relaciones Internacionales and at the University of Havana and other Cuban university centers. Um, Professor Alsugaray, has also been visiting professor at many universities in Europe and North America. He has authored many books and journal articles and book chapters, and he's a regular commentator for Telesur, Al Jazeera, CNN, BBC, El País, and other international news networks. So I invite you to make your presentation. Uh, thank you, Professor Byron. It's a pleasure for me to be again uh, in your hands, in your very able hands as uh, a leader of our uh, Caribbean community of academics. My presentation will be about Cuba-US relations in pandemic times. And <laughs> I have changed a little bit of uh, the, the, your, uh, your suggestion of title, uh, and I am turning it into a question. Are there any opportunities for engagement? Because uh, US-Cuban relations are at a very low point at this time. Um, I don't know if you are going to change the slide. Uh, My presentation will start uh, with the example of uh, the Obama, Raul Castro uh, agreement. The Obama Raul Castro agreement is in my view, an example of what would be uh, the, the engagement that, uh, that one would expect in Cuba and US relations. Um, it's, it's important to bear in mind that our relationship, uh, the relationship between Cuba and the United States is um, enshrined in, its, in, its, in, its, in a combination of factors, neighborliness, we are neighbors, we are very close neighbors, geopolitics, history, and asymmetry, because one of the things that 
determines the relationship between Cuba and the United States is asymmetry, which is a very big asymmetry as anyone, uh, and as the map that I want to show uh, shows, we are right there and we are asymmetric. So let me go first to uh, an analysis of what the Raul Castro Obama agreement for engagement meant in terms of changing the dynamics of what had been a history of conflict between our two nations. Um, and this, I think it is important because you hear a lot about how Cuba missed the opportunity, how Cuba did not deliver on what Obama had, uh, had proposed. In fact, it is being said very often that Obama gave everything and Cuba didn't give anything, which is not exactly what it was all about. First, let me remind you that what Obama and Raul Castro agreed was a process of normalization of relations through diplomatic engagement with the opening of embassies in each other uh, capitals. Remember, the United States broke diplomatic relations with Cuba in 1961. From 1961 to 1977, there was no diplomatic engagement. Then from 1977 to 2015, we had intersections which limited the capacity of diplomatic exchanges, but that all that changed in the 717, 2014. Now, let me point out some of the points that, that this meant. One, the US accepted the legitimacy of the Cuban government and agreed to Cuba's participation in the Panama summit. For that purpose, the United States took Cuba out of the list of states that sponsor terrorism. Many specialists, including me, think that Cuba shouldn't have never have been in that list because there was no evidence of Cuban cooperation with terrorist activities against the United States. A redefinition of US objectives in Cuba, regime change was put on the back seat. The lifting of US sanctions or unilateral coercive measure as a target, but not as something that was achievable because of uh, United States uh, domestic uh, conditions. Congress, it depends on Congress to lift the sanctions. Uh, it's important that Obama did not demand any concession for this process. As a matter of fact, in his last State of the Union message to the US Congress, he demanded the unconditional lifting of the embargo or the blockade against Cuba. Uh, but in the meantime, Obama did some uh, concessions to Cuba in terms of opening up for exchanges, which are not really concessions, are basically putting uh, relations uh, into normal. Uh, U.S. and Cuban national security interests were redefined. As a matter of fact, both sides found that on drug trafficking, on human trafficking, on immigration, on climate change, on pandemias, they had a lot of common interests and that they could work together. Cuba accepted that a full diplomatic U.S. presence in Havana, an embassy, was not a threat, although it remained a challenge and uh, limited economic opportunities were open. Diplomatic cooperation extended to Colombia, Ebola, climate change. You saw a lot of uh, exchanges between the two sides. Now, how to evaluate that? Well, it was too, too little time. It was all, it lasted only for about two years. It proved it, yet it proved favorable for a number of changes in Cuba and the United States. There was resistance on both sides, and it's only normal that uh, that resistance existed. And it all came to a fruition in the 2020 election. There was a change in the Cuban-American electoral tendency 
from 2016 to 2020 and to today. It's very interesting. That's a factor that all the polls indicated that young Cuban Americans who had immigrated after the 1990s to the United States were moving to the Democratic side. But suddenly in 2020, uh, uh, Donald Trump made great inroads with his uh, very, um, let's say, very aggressive position on Cuba. Uh, better political climate in the region. I think the region in general uh, benefited from that engagement. Uh, and, the and, and it was the beginning of a favorable tendency to change economically and politically in Cuba. Cuba did not take full advantage of the changes. This is something that has to be recognized. But it's only understandable after uh, more than 50 years of conflict, the smaller nation, of course, had to approach this in a very careful way. I remember that Wayne Smith, who had been an American diplomat in Havana, was asked once how did Cuba and the United States would do to normalize their relations. And Wayne, who was very, who is very, very, very humorous man, said, like two porcupines making law, very carefully. And, and, and it was normal that it was very carefully. It's interesting, and this is my hypothesis, because in Cuba, some people argue that the process of approachment with the United States gives the United States the possibility of subverting the Cuban government. But in my view, normalization subverts the subversion. So let me go now to what happened on the Trump, uh, during the Trump time. Now, it's important to take into, into consideration that when Trump became president, there was a big change in Cuba, the, what I call the generational transition of power from the historic leadership of the revolution to the new leadership. So let me characterize a little bit the new leadership led by President Miguel diaz Canel. It's a new generation of Cuban leaders educated or less experienced, they have the big challenge of where to go. Either somos continuidad, that is to continue in the same path, or change everything that has to be changed, a phrase that goes back to uh, Fidel Castro's definition of revolution. Less sure of their relationship with the world, where, where you had leaders like Fidel and Raul Castro who were very at ease in world uh, in the world context, Diaz Canel doesn't have yet that capacity. More ideologically rigid and less economically pragmatic. This is something that you can compare Diaz Canel with Raúl Castro. But it is true also that they uh, these new leaders um, made a political transition inside the Cuban Communist Party without any problem. There was no turbulence in that, in that process of change. Uh, they succeeded in the creation of a new constitution, which is uh, a step forward with important procedural changes, but with uh, rigid fundamentals. The opening to internet, the search of a communication model, and then suddenly the pandemia. The pandemia became the great challenge for the Diaz-Canel administration. And at the beginning, uh, they were able to do it well. They developed the Cuban vaccines with the help of the development of the pharmaceutical industry, but they had a big problem. They had delayed so much the process of economic change that this had an impact in, in the way that you would manage the pandemic. It's, this is even paradoxical. Uh, Cuba has had to deal with the pandemia even in the middle of an increase in economic sanctions by the United States. By the way, the economic sanctions use the Venezuelan issue as the big uh, cause for imposing new sanctions. Not that anything Cuba did had to do anything with that. Now, the Trump, the Trump policy um, was basically uh, a policy of maximum pressure and bullying, 
which was facilitated by the fact that the region moved away from the pink tide that had been characterized uh, during Obama's time to a surge of right-wing governments, although that is a little bit changing right now. Now, um, from June 2017, uh, Mr. Trump um, said, I am going to reverse everything that Obama did and go back to the traditional Republican regime change policies. His position was facilitated by the surge of some mysterious acoustic problems in Cuba, uh, which has been named the Havana syndrome, which makes us very, very, very unhappy because that it, it has now been happening in many places, even in Washington, even in the White House, there have had this, these events. But this gave the United States the possibility, the Trump administration the possibility of reducing the embassy without the breaking with Cuba. Now, it's obvious that from the moment that John Bolton and Mauricio Claver Caron took over policy towards Cuba and the White House and uh, defined the so-called Troika of tyranny, uh, it was an increase on, um, on, on pressure on Cuba. This was accompanied by the Venezuelan Guaido gambit that the uh, US administration tried and has failed. 240 new sanctions were imposed on Cuba. Hans Burton, the title third of the Hans Burton uh, law, which increases pressure, economic pressure on Cuba was, was, uh, was an, um, uh, enforced. Sanctions were increased in pandemic times. Remittances were curtailed and Cuba was put back in the terrorist list. So we are back, we were set back to uh, the situation in, um, in uh, the situation in, the situation in, uh, the situation in, 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 excuse me, I, I lost track of what why I would say. Uh, okay, let's go to the next to the next slide where I discuss the Biden thing. Now, it's it's interesting how the Cuba issue developed in the presidential campaign. It was obvious from the beginning that there was a new climate. That, uh, for example, I remember that in two thousand eight. President Obama spoke about engagement with Cuba, about talking with Raul Castro, about he even uh, talked about what a good job Cuban doctors had done around the world. Nothing happened. But this year in 2020, as soon as Bernie Sanders said something about, about how good education was in Cuba, all hell broke loose. And this led to um, a tightening of the political positions, including Mr. Biden. But Mr. Biden, it must take, it must be recognized that initially, when he was running against Bernie Sanders for the nomination of the Democratic Party, he took a, a hard line on Cuba, but then he changed to a softer line and even criticized uh, Trump's policy, saying that it didn't bring. Uh, um, democracy to Cuba, which which is and and I was reminded of this when when Ivalo was making his his initial statement about Anthony Eden said that foreign policy that is not based in reality is bound to have problems. When this is this is the problem with the with U.S. policy towards Cuba, it's it's it 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 lives in a parallel world. Be basically because of domestic issues. Now, um, it's obvious that the, the election this year, even though Biden won the election and he had promised to reverse the Trump, uh, the Trump uh, policies, but it's obvious that the loss in Florida, the loss of two seats in Florida, but more important, the fact that Biden was not able to get a clear majority in the Senate, he has a 50-50 with 
Vice President Kamala Harris vote deciding, that means every senator counts. And this is where Senator Bob Menendez from New Jersey played a role. It's obvious from what you see now that the influence of Senator Menendez, who opposes any, any, uh, any opening to Cuba, he opposed Obama's policy, uh, practically paralyzed the Biden administration. And the Biden administration came up with the idea that Cuba was not a priority, that they shouldn't do anything. And all the promises he had made, which included reopening the consulate in Havana, uh, reestablishing the remittances, it should include eventually the, 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 the withdrawing of Cuba from the terrorism list. He didn't do anything about that. But then July 11 demonstrations happened and suddenly Cuba became a priority, but not in the terms that the Biden administration would have hoped. Uh, the Biden administration had, had left Cuba as a non-priority issue for the first six months, basically because of the influence of, um, of uh, Senator Menendez. And suddenly he confronts a crisis and Cuba becomes a priority. But it becomes a priority in terms that are very negative for the Biden administration. In my view, the way that things paint at this moment, it's very probable that nothing that he can work very little on reengaging with Cuba, which apparently was what some of his of his uh, of his advisors wanted eventually to happen, but not exactly like the Obama period, but in a different way. But now he is with uh, one would say in Cuba una papa caliente a hot potato in his hands. And it's very difficult that who wins this one. Let me go to my conclusions. My conclusions are the following. Um, first, uh, both governments are involved in solving difficult challenge which have to do with COVID. Cuba initially, the Cuban government initially handled very well COVID but things have turned out very sour lately, especially with the Delta uh, variant of COVID. Uh, deaths and, and contamination has gone up uh, and Cuba has not been able to open to tourism. They are announcing now that they're going to open, that they are going to start the condition to see if they can open gradually on November 15th. For, the Cuban government, the challenges are huge because remember, the Trump administration sanctions are still in place and this makes it very difficult for Cuba to do anything uh, in economic terms. It also now has to deal with the political crisis provoked by the, 10, the 11 July demonstrations. So I would say that the road towards re-engagement would be long, full of bumps and dangers, but on the other hand, I might suggest to my Caribbean friends that maybe at some point in time, the Caribbean will have to play, to take the diplomatic initiative as happened when the St. Augustine uh, summit in 2009, where some Caribbean nations, including the prime minister of Trinidad Tobago, uh, insisted on President Obama that something had to be done about Cuba. Thank you very much, Professor Byron. Thank you very much to all the rest of the panelists. And I am ready to answer any question. Thank you very much, uh, Professor al -Sukaray. And we now move on to Dr. George Foriol, our next speaker, who will be speaking on Haiti, challenges and opportunities. Dr. Foriol is a fellow with the Caribbean Policy Consortium and he's a senior associate at the Center for Strategic and International Studies at Georgetown University. He also teaches um, in the Democracy and Governance graduate program there. And he's a think tank Haiti steering group member. He has extensive international and cross region 
regionals on Caribbean basin politics and US foreign and security policy in the region. When I was a graduate student and afterwards, one of the first people whose work I read on the Caribbean and US foreign policy, Dr. Foriel, was yours. So welcome, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, for, uh, Professor Byron. Let me uh, put my presentation on the screen. There we are. Oops, what happened? I think I lost it. Let me try again. Sorry, I apologize. Not having much luck here. I think it would be better if maybe you moved on to the next uh, speaker. Professor Barron, I apologize. We're having technical problems here. Sure, no problem. So what I'll do is just move on to Professor Brian, and then we'll come back to you, George, a little Thank later. Thank you. OK. What you could send your slides to Zara if you want. Um, good. So it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Anthony Bryan our next speaker who will be speaking on the topic, Blue Economy Resilience. Professor Brian is very well known as a former director here at the Institute of International Relations. And he is also a co-chair of the Caribbean Policy Consortium. He remains a senior fellow at the Institute and he's a senior associate of the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington and he's a leading scholar on security issues in the Caribbean and Central America, and an independent consultant on energy development, renewable energy, and energy security and geopolitics in the Caribbean and Latin America. And of course, he has edited many books and articles in those fields. Professor Brian, welcome. Thank you very much, Jessica. <coughs> um, this is an interesting evening. Um, the fields that I normally deal with, which would be regional security or energy geopolitics, they're not part of the agenda tonight. <clears throat> which reminds me of, if you remember the old Monty Python shows, um, they used to begin with the words, and now for something entirely different. And that's what this is all about. The issue is the blue economy and the impact that that could have on Caribbean US relations. For those who are not in the know about the blue economy, it is briefly defined as the concept of a sustainable ocean economy that provides social and economic benefits for current and future generations. How does it impact US-Caribbean relations? At first, the links may appear to be elusive, but in reality, they are not. Please bear with me. First of all, the development of Caribbean blue economies requires a recognition of the value of all marine ecosystem services, as well as an appreciation of the current health of critical marine habitat on fisheries resources, for example. 
It also needs to incorporate the continued projections of climate change variability. So in our region, political decision makers must actively guide urgently needed improvements in ocean policy planning and the coherence of institutional arrangements for a more adaptive implementation of the blue economy agenda. There is a book that um, I mentioned in my brief bio called Caribbean Blue Economy. A number of us contributed to it, both North American, European and Caribbean scholars. And in that book, I talked about oil and gas and the fact that it may be phased out decades from now because of renewable energy. But at the present time, oil and gas still plays a critical role in financing our transitions to green and blue economies. And they maintain economic resilience for countries that are fortunate in having these resources. In our CARICOM region, take Guyana, Suriname, and Trinidad and Tobago. So expanded marine oil and gas industries is inevitable for the immediate future. They raise concerns about their place in a responsible blue economy, obviously. Extracting deep seabed minerals and genetic resources although also have underlying risks. But the point is this, when we think of US-Caribbean relations, the role of the American and other large international oil companies in oil and gas exploration and production are part of the mix in reaching for the Caribbean blue economy. They are important because they are the ones involved in the extractive industry. The same thing goes for other sectors. Let's look at tourism. If we focus on marine resources, the growth of marine-based tourism is a mainstay of many island economies in the Caribbean. For the survival of the industry, they will need to mitigate and to manage climate change effects, as well as other global risks. Some of these risks I think you're all aware of, economic shocks, possible acts of terrorism, public health issues, which were recently demonstrated by US cruise ship tourism being associated with the coronavirus pandemic. There's also the question of expansion of port facilities to accommodate cruise ship traffic and container transshipment. These things will bring opportunities as well as risks and challenges to our island. If we look at fisheries and agriculture at the local level, Growth in the fisheries sector will require rehabilitation of fisheries habitats. In fact, rebuilding some stocks to meet the harvest potential, as well as in developing value added projects. Similarly, agriculture will require value chain analysis to ensure sustainability. So this leads me to a series of observations by way of really coming to a conclusion. First, Coastal and marine economic, sorry, ecosystems are the foundation of the blue economy. And success here will require much better collaboration among different economic sectors and stakeholders to improve that environment. Unless ecosystem degradation can be halted and reversed, the ecosystem services that support existed ocean-based economic activities such as tourism, um, these things will be lost. So the bottom line here is that new activities must be developed in ways that do not contribute to ecosystem destruction. It is also necessary to halt resource over-exploitation by eliminating overfishing and other destructive fishing practices, particularly in vulnerable reef-associated ecosystems. The fundamental point here is that very few countries in the Caribbean have the capacity to manage coastal fisheries or even coastal tourism. 
These things are often major sources of environmental damages. As I said, new approaches such as marine spatial planning can help. But ultimately, you know, it will be about the political will to make people change their behavior. And this is another area with respect to US Caribbean relations. We may not have it, but the United States has the capacity to transfer knowledge and, of course, investment and assistance to the region to help mitigate these problems. Certainly, that is true when it comes to tourism and to cruise ship tourism. The United States could be a valuable partner in all of this. I must make the observation at the current time, it may be the cause of the problem, but that does not mean it cannot be a part of the solution. So it depends on how we negotiate this. Another point that we need to consider briefly is equitability and social justice. The region is going to see significant investment in technology and expertise. And these new opportunities come with significant risks. Unless they are well managed, they could contribute to further ecosystem degradation and loss of benefit. The large investments required for many of these new ocean opportunities also mean that they will benefit primarily the wealthy and possibly even contribute to poverty and forms of social just injustice, for example, in small scale fishery. So the, the, the specter in my mind of further marginalization of fisher folk and privatization of the assets on which their livelihoods depend is something that we are currently witnessing. I think a similar concern exists for sectors such as vertically integrated and all-inclusive hotels, which displace smaller scale and community-based tourism. So failure to do some of this adjustment to promote equitable opportunities and social justice means, of course, that as you are looking towards the blue economy, there could be marginalization of local initiatives and creation of opportunities for the wealthy, large, mostly foreign-owned corporation. This can increase, I think, the inequality between rich and poor, so we have to tread very carefully. Another point is effective governance. This includes local level governance of coastal and marine areas for productive fishing and tourism. We have to look at community-based management and other innovative approaches that have to fit with national level of arrangements and regional level. Capital investment obviously is required to realize much of the new potential identified with respect to renewable energy fisheries, innovative tourism supports. And here is the link again. A number of these international investors will come from the United States. Here I might add, there is a new sense of corporate social responsibility emerging, even among oil companies. Of course, in order to minimize investment risk, investors want to see good governance in place, adherence to the rule of law. In addition, transparency, transparency, streamlined administrative processes, these are also keys to facilitate investment. Unfortunately, today in the Caribbean, there are significant barriers to attracting greater levels of finance, whether from the US, Europe, or elsewhere. And these include, I think, some, all of us pretty much know this, the high debt to GDP ratios, the, the region's relatively high level of per capita income, and the current de-risking and withdrawal of correspondent banking relationships from Caribbean financial institutions by some North American and European banks. These matters, have to be taken into account. And one final area is science-based development. Technical capacity across a range of sciences is required for successful blue economy development. <clears throat> but that technical capacity is still weak in many countries of the region. Developing them will require long-term investment in infrastructure and human technological capacity. And resilience key item here. So if countries like ours are to partner successfully 
with external governments and corporations such as in the United States and get a fair share of the benefits. These are the recommendations that experts from our region have made about external involvement. And this brings me to the final point. Blue economy growth is being pursued worldwide with the help and advice of international agencies. One thing is of the World Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, the Asian Development Bank, the UNDP. These are already well-versed in programmatic approaches that can drive regional and national development agendas. It is then our responsibility in the Caribbean to ensure that these agendas are consistent with and support our national and regional Caribbean agenda, rather than driving us into unsuitable directions. The same applies to corporate global entities whose investment we need. We need it, but not at any cost. So we have to maintain an appropriate balance, be concerned about Caribbean people and culture, so that our state and non-state actors will need to be very sensitive about global perspectives, be very proactive in creating a suitable Caribbean in the sectoral reality that values nature and recognizes power as asymmetries in the region. So we come back to the asymmetry that Ivlo mentioned, that Carlos Atsugaray mentioned, um, and that asymmetry, of course, relates primarily to the US. The bottom line is that thinking and planning ahead with respect to the blue economy and incidentally the green economy will allow countries to develop their individual and collective approaches so as to take advantage of what is available in a coordinated and comprehensive way. So let me end by saying that I think given the commentaries of the previous speakers with respect to asymmetry, geopolitics, development, resource exploitation, etc. All of them are evident in the blue economy context. I urge you to run out and buy the book. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Brian. And now we're going to go back to Dr. Foriol um, to allow him to complete his presentation. So George, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Professor Byron, and also thank you for uh, giving a plug for the first uh, publication I ever had, which was actually on, you're right, on Caribbean foreign policy. Uh, thank you for hosting and moderating this, uh, this timely uh, webinar, and I apologize to the audience for the uh, technical glitch, but now it's in the hands, uh, uh, in good hands to, to, uh, to proceed. Let me first maybe pause uh, on this sort of title page to maybe state state the obvious, uh, which is maybe unlike one of the previous speakers dealing with, with Cuba. The interaction between Haiti and the United States is a rich and complicated one and has a long, a long history. Uh, the issue here in some ways today is more of, a, of challenging uh, us to be able to, to, in effect, end up with, with uh, more, more positive outcomes to the various layers of initiatives that have characterized US-Caribbean relations and more broadly, Haiti's relations with, uh, with the international community. Uh, next. First, sort of a brief uh, overview. Uh, obviously, a, a turbulent history that since the mid 1990s has generated a, what I would describe as a quasi permanent a multinational political security and to some degree economic development engaged by engagement by a whole series of actors, not only the United States. Uh, a political experience that over the past uh, three decades, <clears throat> I describe essentially as a, a sequence of elections uh, linked by, by political crises and, uh, and breakdowns. And this, this year alone in 2021, in the first nine months of the year, uh, political crises, electoral crises actually uh, triggered by events of the last two years, deepened obviously by the assassination of President jo Jovenel Moise, uh, in July, and then to make matters worse, uh, uh, a serious earthquake uh, in, uh, in mid-August. Next, please. Uh, the absence 
of a working political consensus uh, has limited uh, the consolidation of modern governance, let alone democratic governance uh, in Haiti, and has not improved, obviously, the well-being of most Haitians uh, over, over time. Uh, this, uh, these electoral breakdowns that I've mentioned uh, have, uh, have implications in the sense that uh, uh, following every electoral cycle, in effect, the, the electoral system, the process, the machinery literally uh, has to be recreated. Uh, this is not surprising, uh, and as a result, it is unlikely, despite uh, some hopes, uh, including some from U.S. policymakers, that elections can be held in the remainder of this year is obviously <clears throat> un unlikely. The backdrop to all of this <clears throat> obviously is also unrealistic and at times, I would say, undisciplined expectations among international actors, including the United States. Next. This is not for a uh, lack of goodwill uh, by many and a, certainly a, a long catalog uh, of initiatives uh, by the United States uh, and a whole universe of actors uh, literally from around the world. This is sort of a brief snapshot of what I mean by that. Over the past decade, the United States alone uh, has provided over $5 billion in disaster relief, uh, long-term recovery, reconstruction, security assistance, particularly related to, uh, to the Haitian National Police, and a variety of development uh, programs uh, and initiatives. In tandem, obviously, is also a, a series of, of financial packages, uh, aid programs uh, from other uh, country donors, particularly uh, Canada and the European Union, let alone the World Bank, the IDB, and, uh, and, and other financial institutions. And since particularly since, since 2004, uh, a quasi-permanent uh, United Nations presence that until 2017 uh, included uh, significant peacekeeping operations. And also over time, there's been sort of a parallel efforts on a part of the organization of American states. Next. Yet despite all of these efforts, uh, including efforts on the part of Haitian actors themselves, the, the painful assessment that one can point to is overall disappointing outcomes. Here's some sort of data points, but I'm sure all of you in the audience can think of your own examples, which is this, despite all these efforts, uh, almost 60% of the country's 10 plus million people still live in poverty. Haiti, in fact, is still recovering from the 2010 earthquake, uh, let alone the hurricane in 2016, and now another uh, dramatic event uh, last, uh, last month. Key factors that ultimately undermine all this uh, are sort of dismal governance performance and a really systemic corruption that covers all layers, all levels, particularly of public governance, and also to some degree even into the private sector elements of the economy. Transparency International's 2020 index ranked Haiti at the, among the bottom 10 globally, ranked between Afghanistan and Democratic Republic of the Congo. I, I mentioned these two, what I call case studies, simply by the sheer scope of the amounts that we are talking about here, the Petro-Caribe embezzlement, the, the Venezuela discounted oil for social program initiative, which somewhere in the range of 1.5 to $2.5 billion basically disappeared into thin air, as well as the, the 2010 earthquake reconstruction effort, where a lot of it in some ways either never reached the intended beneficiaries in Haiti. Some of it was diverted. Some of it was actually never spent, interestingly enough. So the question, obviously, in the wake of the 2021 earthquake of last month, uh, have international donors, have Haitian partners learned the lessons of the 2010 uh, disaster relief effort? Next. The answer to that question is not as simple as it sounds uh, and is made more urgent considering the timeline of events over the past uh, 24 months. Uh, in this sort of list that I have here on the screen, I draw your attention to the, to the three items that are highlighted in yellow in part because they remain unresolved. And as, they, as long as they remain unresolved politically, 
it's going to be very difficult for the process to move forward and for international actors to be able to play a critical role in this arena. The elections, uh, parliamentary elections of October 2019 have yet to be held, which resulted early last year by the late Moise, President Moise, starting to govern by decree. And then in a rather audacious development late last fall, Moise and his associates decided to launch a constitutional effort of the, of the 90, 1987 constitution, which by all accounts does, does require an update, but the process that was pursued took so many shortcuts that quickly ran into political, let alone legal and constitutional challenges. The other two items that I'll highlight there are also, they're related, and as, as long as they remain in a state of crisis, it ultimately becomes difficult to see a way out very clearly in the near future. The rise in kidnapping and organized gang violence has sort of reached an industrial scale, not only of the last year, but of the last several years. And obviously to some degree is the backdrop to the as yet unresolved and, and, mis and mis clearly no clear scenario that has emerged regarding the assassination of President Jovenel Moise in, on July the, the 7th. The other, these issues ultimately cumulatively complicate the assessments uh, the, of, of international actors, let alone the United States, in trying to pinpoint where their efforts might be the most, most helpful and useful. Next. For its part, the major challenge for the United States is going to be to, to in effect, synchronize the various needs and pressure points that I've just described in the Haitian environment. There, in fact, multiple layers of needs and ultimately multiple actors that ultimately can play a role in, uh, on a part of the, in the United States context as well as among other international actors. The step by the administration to name a special envoy was actually a move in the right direction. Ambassador Foote is actually an experienced Haiti hand having been number two at the embassy previously, therefore knows many of the Haitian actors personally. And I think that's, a, that's an important development. To some degree, politically, and in terms of the broad policy context, the fact that the administration is still waiting for the confirmation of an assistant secretary for the Western Hemisphere in some ways is unfortunate, and to some degree indicates a little bit the, the piecemeal approach that might, one might see not only on Haiti, but on the rest of the Caribbean. Separating out uh, humanitarian assistance, which is an immediate issue uh, in which the United States Agency for International Development is clearly taking the lead, and to separate those out from a series of other and more complicated efforts involving Haiti's uh, political crisis and security needs, I think this, this, both, both areas need attention, uh, some immediately, but in the case of political and security issues, it's going to require some more deep thinking as to how to proceed. One of the major lessons maybe of the 2010 earthquake is obviously to involve more closely Haitian civil society organizations and the reconstruction process as well, let alone particularly in the political process. Uh, and this is where the point of contact ultimately with those institutions is gonna be an important, an important aspect of US policy as well as other international actors. I mentioned the US congressional engagement. Haiti has always been an interest of the United States Congress, although it's at times been diffuse and I would say not always terribly effective there's been a recreation of the Haiti caucus. I think this is actually a potentially positive platform, but it, it needs a clearer focus. And in fact, could actually be a point of interaction, particularly for Haitian civil society and political party actors. Uh, next. Let me therefore conclude with, with the following. This is sort of a list of policy priorities. I'd be hard pressed to really try to suggest that there are some are more important than others. Uh, U.S. policy in some ways is, in this case, is motivated by a series of interrelated uh, motivations, uh, humanitarian concerns and resiliency in terms of how to build, build better, if you will. Clearly, regional health geopolitics has now become an important issue. Uh, Haiti only received its first shipment of COVID-19 vaccines over the last uh, 90, well, 60 to 75 days. Immigration and refugee policy consideration is an important variable in how the United States pays attention to Haiti and has paid attention to Haiti in the past. 
as well as limiting Haiti's uh, potential as a platform for regional drug trafficking, gun trafficking, as well as crime networks. Uh, all those factors ultimately are in the background, if you will, of US policy interests uh, in, in Haiti. I would say among this list, one that I think is particularly significant, and I, uh, my, I would argue without a clear understanding of what happened on that first item, which is what happened in the context of the assassination of President Moise. I think that we need a better explanation. Who was involved? How did it happen? Uh, because as long as this issue is not really addressed and resolved properly, the, the, the environment of mistrust uh, is going to continue among Haiti's key political actors. And as a result, some of the key political issues that need to be addressed are ultimately going to be to be delayed. The United States can play an important role in this regard, both in terms of its investigating capabilities through the FBI and other agencies, but also through intelligence and sort of a networking effort to try to piece together a plausible explanation as to what really happened uh, on July the 7th. Um, I list these areas here uh, to keep sort of the audience Remind him that these are all priority issues, and I would only highlight in conclusion the last one, which is emergency economic support. Haiti is probably going to need fairly quickly an inflow of emergency economic assistance for the United States and other actors. The economy has, in fact, been on the ropes for the last year and a half to two years, uh, and much of the revenues that have been generated through through legitimate sources now practically disappeared. And I think this is going to be an important issue to address in the short run. And I hope in some ways that congressional action in this area will only be, uh, be, be taken up fairly quickly. I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Foriol. And I think you have, your presentation was as useful for CARICOM listeners as for looking at US priorities in Haiti. Um, we now turn to our final presenter, Professor Norman Monroe. Dr. Monroe is a full professor in the engineering, mechanical and materials engineering department at Florida International University. Uh, his research focuses on the design and the deployment of renewable energy systems. Like all our other um, speakers, he has published extensively in his areas of expertise. And I'm going to welcome Dr. Monroe, Professor Monroe, and I would ask you to go straight into your presentation in the interests of time. Thank you very much, Professor Byron, for hosting this webinar and Professor Griffith and everyone else involved for putting on this timely webinar. I'm gonna talk about climate resilience and challenges and opportunities. Next slide. Climate change due to global warming. Next slide, please. Climate change due to global warming is a slow moving catastrophe which manifests itself in extreme weather events. Global warming is the greatest existing threat to life that must be mitigated with some degree of accommodation and I will, I will talk about that a little later. The irony is that the mechanism that produces global warming is the same mechanism that for thousands of years enabled life on Earth via the greenhouse effect. And without the greenhouse effect, the average Earth temperature would have been about zero degrees Fahrenheit or minus 18 degrees Celsius. Instead, we have a tolerable, ter tolerable warmer average temperature of about 59 degrees Fahrenheit or 15 to 20 degrees Celsius. Next slide, please. Here's a schematic of the greenhouse effect, which shows uh, activities in Earth, um, energy production by fossil fuels, the emission of gases and the rays of the sun traveling towards Earth, being absorbed and being reflected. Next slide, please. The main greenhouse gases are carbon dioxide. Everyone talks about lowering the carbon footprint and everything is measured in terms of carbon dioxide equivalent. 
but there are others, methane, nitrous oxides, hydrofluorocarbons, perfluorocarbons, sulfur hexafluoride, et cetera. And there's a general correlation that shows the carbon dioxide increase since the industrial revolution and uh, where we are today in terms of global temperature, there's a direct correlation. The next slide talks about global greenhouse gas emissions by the different types of gases. And as you can see, about 65% it's due to carbon dioxide as a result of fossil fuel usage and industrial processes. And you also have carbon dioxide from forestry and other land use activities. But then you see again, methane 16% and nitrous oxide of about 6%. If you were to look at the different economic sectors, you will see the main contributors to carbon dioxide, namely agriculture and other land use, electricity and heat production and transportation are some of the major sectors. The next slide, please. So why do we always talk in terms of carbon dioxide? As you could see on the extreme right of this table, it has a global warming potential of one and everything is measured in terms of carbon dioxide. So for example, if you were to, to consider methane, it is 23 more times capable of warming the atmosphere. And if you look at nitrous oxides, which are emitted from transportation, industries, literally the tailpipe of your cars, it's about 296 times more warming. Uh, at the bottom of the table, you'll see sulfur hexafluoride, which is the highest, has the highest global warming potential. And then if you look in the middle column and you look at the atmospheric lifetimes, and that's why I said we'll have to accommodate global warming because the damage is already done. You can't reverse what has happened because if you look at the lifetime of say the nitrous oxides, it's 110, 114 years. The hydrofluorocarbons in terms of years where it will exist in the atmosphere is even much higher. And so the damage is done and we will have to accommodate what, what, we, what we have. The next slide please. Consequences of global warming. If you look at the Arctic ice cap in 1979 to 2003, you could see what has happened. And um, not only has it affected the ecosystem with the polar bears, etc., but you also have what you call the albedo effect, which is the reduction of the amount of the sun's radiation back into space mostly from the melting of the polarized sheets. So it leaves just the relatively dark oceans and the land that is there to absorb the radiation. And so this further warms the, pl the, the planet and which would lead to further welting of the thermo thermofrost. Next slide, please. In terms of everyday life, you're gonna have temperature increase, sea level rise and more rain. Talk to the people in New York and they'll tell you about more rain in New Jersey and the tri-state area, Louisiana, et cetera. But in terms of uh, food security, you're gonna have issues with crop yields, irrigation, and the diversity in the forest, water resources could be impacted, erosion, those Caribbean countries that depend on tourism, you're gonna have erosion of the beaches, inundation, et cetera. And then you also have bio biodiversity, modification of ecosystems and infectious disease vectors. Next slide, please. I want to get, show here a, a, pro a projected computer simulated case study of the Diana flood scenarios in the Myconi. After say eight inches of rainfall in 24 hours, to the left, you could see the land as it, as it should be. And after eight inches of rainfall, you can see what is beginning to happen. Now, Guyana's coast is below sea level. 
The next slide, please. And so there's been a constant battle to keep the ocean out. But look what happens after 18 inches to the left and after 28 inches of rainfall. See what happens to that community. Next slide, please. So with regards to the Caribbean, climate change represents one of the most serious challenges for development prospects. Caribbean countries have not been a major contributor, but bear the brunt of its impacts in terms of rising sea levels, beach erosion, and extreme weather events. And so mitigating efforts to combat climate change will provide opportunities for stakeholders interested in sustainable development in the region. And these stakeholders must include members of the diaspora, renewable energy practitioners, and others. Next slide, please. Some other impacts, business interruption, forced migration, health and productivity issues, and there will be indirect labor effects. Next slide, please. Looking at greenhouse gas emissions by country, and this is 2021 numbers, you could see the main polluters, China, uh, followed by the United States, India, and I just added Suriname, Guyana, Barbados, Trinidad and Tobago and Jamaica, just to put things in perspective. And you could see it's very insignificant as compared to the major industrial world. Next slide, please. Here again is CO2 emissions in the Caribbean, starting from around 1910 in the case of Trinidad and Tobago with its oil and gas. And later in the 50s, in terms of Barbados, Guyana, Jamaica, St. Vincent, et cetera. And you could see um, the tons of CO2 emissions. Next slide, please. I want to talk a little bit about the Climate Risk Index, which is developed by German Watch, and it analyzes and quantifies the impact of extreme weather events in terms of fatalities, as well as economic losses. Worldwide deaths have been half a million and above. 2.56 trillion, and you had about 11,000 extreme events between the year 2000 and 2019. Puerto Rico, Haiti, and Bahamas have the highest CRIs of one, three, and six respectively. They were the most impacted by extreme weather. Estimates by the IPCC are very conservative because additional carbon dioxide that was previously locked is now being released as a result of the, the warming of the Arctic permafrost. And so the underestimation is in, is in terms of 54 trillion to 69 trillion respectively. The next slide. So, we can see that developing countries are particularly affected by the impacts of climate change because of their vulnerability to damaging effects of the hazard and lower coping capacity. So we have seen the global COVID pandemic reiterated the fact that both risk and vulnerability are systemic and interconnected. It is therefore imperative to strengthen the resilience of the most vulnerable against these risks whether it is climatic, geophysical, economic, or health related. The next slide, please. What we have helping us is the climate change is the public law um, 114-291, which states that it is the US policy to increase engagement with the governments of the Caribbean region towards economic stability, in the light of changing dynamics in a multi-polarized world. And so herein lies challenges and opportunities, which I will elaborate on. The next slide. Opportunities, job creation, new enterprises, green products, greener workplaces, climate resilience, resilient infrastructure, and the need to improve resilience to secure tourism assets. 
in light of extreme weather events. That's a must for many of the Caribbean countries that depend on tourism. And there's also gonna be a need for diversifying the economy and to stimulate industrial development of added value products. Next slide talks about challenges. With climate events, extreme climate events, you could have job losses. It could result in forced migration, social unrest and poverty, obviously damage to the infrastructure and businesses, health, productivity, and relocation. In the case of Guyana, they're taking, think because of its coast being below the sea level, creation of new cities and new, uh, new capital. And the challenge is a lack of human capital. Next slide, please. There's a need for a united Caribbean. There may be a need to adopt what we call a comparative advantage ethos and a cluster approach. For example, Trinidad, Guyana, and Suriname could form an economic center. Guyana and Suriname have similar land mass, mineral resources, lumber, serve as carbon sink, has hydro, solar, and wind potential and Guyana can serve as a breadbasket of the Caribbean, similar to the San Joaquin Valley in the US. Next slide, please. So energy, renewable energy seems to be one solution. And Christy Urban stated that energy production and energy consumption cause more environment damage than any other peacetime activity on earth. That's a reminder for us going forward. Next slide, please. A path to carbon dioxide neutral in terms of the transportation sector will have to come from a variety of activities in terms of decreased energy consumption and non-fuel usage, non-fossil fuel usage using ethanol, biodiesel, butanol, etc., and the electric vehicles, etc. And of course, the increase of renewable fuels. Next slide. Alternative renewable energy would include wind, photovoltaic, and geothermal. I'm gonna talk a little bit about geothermal. Next slide, please. The Caribbean has potential for geothermal energy. If you look at the regional tectonic setting, you see the Lesser, the Lesser Antilles Island Park, all the countries there have great potential. The next slide, please. So power can be extracted if you were to look at the lower right corner by having injection will, wells Wherever you have volcanic activity, the soil is the soil temperature as you go downwards is relatively warm. And so you can have injection wells and then you have production wells, which can then be what forms steam, which can spin a, a turbine and generate the electricity. And it shows the chain of islands with all of the volcanic activity. It's only Guadeloupe that has um, a 4.5 megawatt equivalent binary plant and Dominica and St. Vincent have developed hydroelectric power. Next slide, please. So natural gas and renewable, renewables for electricity generation would be the way to go. Because as you can see, with natural gas, you can produce it at about four to five cents per kilowatt hour versus 50 cents per kilowatt hour using diesel. And if you were to look at the countries with geopolitical, with geothermal potential ranking, it, it's in this trend, Guadeloupe, St. Lucia, Dominica, St. Vincent, Navies, et cetera, et cetera. In Guyana's case, the government is proceeding with natural gas to elect for, for electricity generation by transporting, transporting it from the Lisa oil field to shore. The next slide, please. Well, I have a list of recommendations which will be published in um, the paper. So I would not go through all of them. 
So the next slide, please. The next slide, please. So in conclusion, I would like to state that we would have to prioritize renewables for electricity generation, implement legislation and regulations that would enable this sector to effectively contribute to the nation's energy security. And renewable energy natural gas usage will reduce oil imports and carbon emissions and enable Caribbean nations to meet their Paris Agreement pledge. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Monroe. Um, I think you've given us much food for thought. Now, folks, we have 10 minutes to go before the end of this webinar and um, tons of questions. So I'm going to have to choose and um, some for the panelists. Um, so let me start with Professor Brian. Um, there are two questions for you. Um, one, is there a need to revisit the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea to address the new developments of the blue economy? And the second one that I'd like to address to you is in the context of the blue economy, what are your thoughts on the Caribbean taking advantage of its strategic location for the development of robust transshipment services? Um, so, Prof. Brian, do you think you can? Yes, I, I can. In, in one or two minutes. Um, <clears throat> yes, I think the, the law of the sea um, would have to be examined again. Remember that the <clears throat> UNCLOS divided the ocean into six different zones, internal waters, territorial sea, contiguous zone, the EZs, continental self, uh, high seas and deep ocean floor. So the challenge today, when we have to look at the blue economy, is the extent to which um, exploration and production activities in the blue economy um, run into difficulties with respect to relevant license concession areas um, throughout the region. There is another problem as well, and that has to do with islands and the fact that some islands, in fact, are demarcation zones for exploration. So the bottom line to answer that question is that in some coastal states are uh, really under a procedural duty to negotiate in good faith with a view to reaching some form of cooperative joint agreement pending the final settlement of their boundaries. Um, I think most of us are aware that at present there are about 16 maritime disputes in the Circum Caribbean region, a lot of them relating to territorial waters. So it is a, an issue that might involve uh, a revisit to UNCLOS. As far as the second question is concerned, the question of transshipment, you know, this is really up to national and regional governance. Um, exactly how are you going to define, um, you know, what is your transshipment zone? There is no one answer for all the countries. So we enter here into the issue of national ocean governance. That has to be a part of the blue economic development. Not only national ocean governance, but also regional ocean governance. And therein lies the answer to both questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Brian. And now there's a, I'm going to direct the next two questions. The first one to um, Ivlo, um, a question from one of our students. How does piracy in the Caribbean affect our chances of activating a blue economy in the region? And for Professor Al Sugaray, um, there have been rumors about the reopening of US consular activity in Havana and the renewal of authorization to send remittances to Cuba. Do you think this will happen soon? Or could the Biden administration wait for a worsening of Cuba's economic situation and do nothing 
as a way of making things more difficult for the new Cuban government. So gentlemen, if you would try to address those questions very quickly. Maximum. Emphasis and very quickly, I think the reality of the blue economy as outlined by Professor Byron suggests the importance of Caribbean countries collaborating not only with the United States and other entities, other states, but among themselves. Piracy issue is also an issue that is pregnant with the need for collaboration. And so to me, separate and apart from the blue economy implications of piracy, piracy in and of itself as a challenge, as a transnational challenge, necessitates Caribbean countries doing much more than, uh, than our that is done right now among themselves within the, within the region. Significant issues in relation to combating piracy has over the decades involved United States engagement to the region. That is, that will need to continue. So for me, the bottom line is yes, there's an implication, but that implication suggests the need for more collaboration among the Caribbean countries and collaboration between Caribbean countries and other entities. Thank you. Uh, Professor Al Sukarai. Well, um, I think it's not a rumor. Actually, one week before July 11, the Biden administration was signaling that, that they were going to do those two things. And even a third thing had been talked about which is uh, allowing flights to different parts of Cuba. Of course, the flights issue has to do with the pandemia. Cuba uh, has restricted flights to Cuba. Right now, for example, there's only one flight to, between Mexico and Havana, and uh, one flight a month. So anyway, uh, the, the consular, the reopening of the consular office is practically it's a done deal. It has been announced that officials can travel to Cuba with um, adult um, uh, dependents. So that obviously is going to happen. The other, the issue of the remittances is, is a little bit more complicated. It seems that there is an agreement with Senator Menendez that yes, the remittances are going to be, there's going to be a plan to, uh, to, to allow the remittances. But there is this question which is very open now, but we have to stop the money for, to get into the Cuban military. This is, this is like a, a, a smoke screen. <laughs> you don't know what that means. Uh, so anyway, uh, the remittances are flowing because you cannot stop that. You cannot stop family from sending money to their relatives. You cannot stop that. That, that. that will come one way or the other. You triangulate, you send the money to Canada and from Canada, someone sends it to Havana. So, so it's a complicated issue, but all because of the sanctions. The sanctions make anything that you do in economic terms in Cuba, a very complicated process. Thank you, Professor Al Sugaray. And now there are two, there are two last questions. No, in fact, <laughs> there's one question. Um, what role for the ACS, whose mandate is based on the coordination of policies across the Caribbean Sea? And I will throw this out to the panel. Um, anybody who would like to provide an answer in one minute, floor is yours. <laughs> Talking okay, about the ACS in, I think, uh, yes, in terms of of uh, for George's hand, yeah. Yeah. George, go ahead, sir. Yeah, you need, George. you need, George. No, yeah, right ahead. No, the, the ACS um the, the plan is, is still relevant, and um, the ACS has done a lot of work in terms of that um, ocean management. So I, I don't think you discount any of those things. Um, they have to be adjusted and adapted as time goes on. Okay. Um, 
ladies and gentlemen. Um, we, um, we, are come, we have come to the end of a very, very full evening, very, very packed webinar. In fact, so packed that unfortunately we have not had time to address all the questions. Um, I would like to suggest to the panelists that there are a couple of questions you might want to um, reply to um, in the chat. Um, I saw a question addressed to Professor Monroe, for example, but I would like to thank our panel for giving us a very rich menu of observations and knowledge on a range of different issue areas that are, um, that are going to be the main agenda for US-Caribbean relations uh, in the months and years ahead. I'd like to thank you all very much for all the effort that you have put into um, your preparation for this evening and for coming and spending time engaging with us. And I'd also like to thank um, the audience for their interest and for the, the number of questions that have come through. And finally, I would like to thank Marketing and Communication who have hosted us on their platform this evening and our team at the IIR, Zara and John and others for supporting and for making all of this happen. Thank you all very much. And we look forward to speaking with you again in the not too distant future. I think I have learned a lot personally this evening and so have, so have many other people in the audience. Good evening and um, stay safe. Thank you very much. Thank you very good much. Good evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoyed it very much. Thank Take you. care.